what we want to talk about at this session, as Josette just mentioned, was you know how does this whole conversation around soil quality, soil health, relate to pest management? And you know we've already talked about that thinking about soil quality has a relationship to nutrient management, salinity, irrigation management, just in general, what is soil quality? Um, but again, when we start thinking about it, and you already heard it in some of the previous presenta presentations, there can be implications, both good and bad, when you focus on some of these soil quality practices in terms of your pest management. Um, so today, we're going to just have a little bit, hear a little bit about what we do know and don't know in this space. I will say there's a lot unknown. I will also say, just as an observation, um, I think Karen Ross men mentioned that in her speech, there's currently a conversation going on in Sacramento um, called the Sustainable Pest Management Advisory Group. And that's um, to Cal uh, well, Cal EPA, to DPR, and CDFA, where they're really asking the question of how can we reduce the use of, quote unquote, please don't kill the messenger, quote unquote, chemical and or risky pesticides. And a lot of that conversation from those, I would say, that are less directly in involved in ag is the assumption that if we work on soil quality, if we work on some of these regenerative ag things, that it will minimize the need for some of these things. So again, think about it from that angle. That's the kind of where some of the policy conversation's going. We're getting the same questions and same thoughts from CPG companies on the sustainability space. So just. I'm putting it in that much larger context, realizing that we don't necessarily have answers for it, but um, just to make my panelists even more nervous. <laughs> so with that, I'm gonna introduce the panelists briefly. We have Greg Brown, and I will say, we didn't think he would be here in person because until this morning, he wasn't allowed to be here. Um, Greg Brown is with USD ARS, those were ARS rules. Uh, based in Davis, plant pathologist. The Almond Board, has, he's worked with the Almond Board for many years, uh, primarily researching around Phytophthora and soil diseases like replant disorder and trying to find fumigant, methyl bromide alternatives, fumigant alternatives. Uh, and his background is, his father was a farm advisor, he's been a farm advisor in his life, and he is an, do you say almond or almond grower? He's an almond grower. <laughs> that tells you where he farms, which is down by Parlier. Um, Carl Wyant is um, by uh, a CCA. He's the head of the Western Regional Crop Advisor. Um, you heard him speak this morning. Uh, based more down in Southern California. And again, he has quite a bit of experience of looking at how soil qualities relate to some of the pest management. And then we have Rory Crowley. He's a local grower, farms a little north of here. Um, he's gonna be on two panels. On this panel, I'm gonna call him the grower because he will talk about his, uh, he was open to having research done his site with anaerobic soil disinfestation or soil biosolarization as well as with cover crops. And so he'll talk about some of his experience from a grower's perspective of employing some of these soil health practices and how they relate to soil pests. And the way we're doing it this time is each of them will get about 10 minutes to speak. Greg will have some slides and then we'll go to questions. Thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, yeah, well, I, the things that I can offer comments relevant to this meeting, uh, the two disease problems are uh, this Prunus replant disease complex and Phytophthora diseases in general. Um, both of these diseases are uh, real intimately influenced by what we do with the soil, what we put in there, and how we manage the soil, <clears throat> not only chemically but physically, and, uh, but they're quite different. Um, replant disease is, I'll just show you some illustration, it's kind of a it's, it's not a lethal disease normally. It doesn't kill trees. Um, however, it severely stunts them when it, when it's, when it occurs. Um, stunting can be something like as severe as here. This, 
this image was actually taken from a trial just a few miles from where we are now. It's where I began work on this disease complex uh, quite a while ago. And then um, this is the more typical situation like we see in the San Joaquin Valley where there's noticeable stunting in this foreground row which is in non-fumigated soil compared to the trees in the background soil where they're growing much more vigorously. Now these both situations, the full range of situations, have real serious uh, implications for yield. They'll cut that early yield out, and you may eventually get a leveling off of yield where um, they're all equal, but you never gain back that early loss of your yield. So uh, that's why we care about it. And then phytophthora diseases, the lethal, the lethal part of this conversation I'm bringing to you um, we really have two um, ways they attack almond in California. We have a, what's typically a young orchard problem, say in, in the early uh, years after planting and up till maybe a few years into bearing. They seem to be especially susceptible to Phytophthora if they're on a susceptible rootstock, um, root and crown rot. So the invasion in that case is from the soil directly into the root system. But we have another um, type of Phytophthora disease. We sometimes call it aerial Phytophthora. Um, we formally know it as perennial Phytophthora canker to distinguish it from the pruning wound cankers that we used to have a lot of when we were pruning more. Um, but it especially, believe it or not, is prevalent in Kern County. But it's, it's occurred up here in Butte County um, and everywhere in between Kern and in this location. Um, it tends to get set up by late rains and uh, various other factors. Okay, so my key points, because Gabrielle knew I would talk too long. So here they are, and uh, if I don't get any farther than this, maybe we'll be okay. Pertaining to these diseases, number one, um, from a lot of trials and experience, I feel like we can manage this prunus replant disease uh, using soil amendment-based approaches as alternatives to soil fumigation. Soil fumigation works great, but we can do this now with amendments. Um, we, we know that um, both microbial communities are very important in how in, in the mediation of this, and also it appears more recently that nutrient management is important part of this approach using amendments. And then uh, soil amendment-based approaches, although they, they work well, they're gonna need a lot of further work before they're affordable, so they're not quite a replacement yet. Um, We've also worked with whole orchard recycling in the broad sense of amendments, and uh, it, for a key point is that it has a neutral effect on prunus replant disease. Um, you have a replant disease component with or without whole re orchard recycling. And then um, we found more recently that both N and P fertilization how we manage that in young orchards can be very important for managing both prunus replant disease and whole orchard recycling. And then shifting to Phytophthora, the dominant factors I feel like that are impacting Phytophthora diseases, both the soilborne and the aerial, are soil water management, whether or not our nursery stock is infested when we bring it in and plant it, and of course, if Phytophthora is in the soil, but the, the nursery stock is very important. And then uh, the re genetic resistance of the rootstock. Phytophthora pathogens are very aggressive. They're not highly responsible, responsive to subtle nutritional management strategies. So although it's nice to think about a lot of these things that can influence tree growth, I would say that it's going to be a harder challenge to influence incidence of Phytophthora with subtle, you know, amendment-based strategies. Um, okay, just some illustrations of the things I've said. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, this, uh, I'll use a recent trial from Kearney Ag Center where we've in, uh, investigated anaerobic soil disinfestation. Um, and then also another trial uh, where we've investigated impacts of whole orchard recycling and in interaction with fumigation. Um, in the, in the, both of these trials have had fertilizer treatments embedded within them so that we can try to um, ferret out the uh, mechanisms involved, the fer fertility aspects. And then I won't talk about it today, but we're following the soil and root microbiology in these trials. So basically what we wanted to find out is if we could run ASD, this anaerobic soil disinfestation, and get a lot of that benefit without doing the full treatment. This just illustrates the typical ASD treatment where we have already incorporated a rice bran or almond hull and shell uh, substrate, uh, covered it, and then we have irrigation lines underneath and we're pulsing it um, every day or every other day. And it's quite costly because of the irrigation system, which is auxiliary, and the tarp. And so we wanted to see, well, how much can we do with just the amendment alone? So this was done both with rice bran substrate, which is relatively expensive, and ground up almond hull and shell, which is less than half the price of rice bran. And we compared these to uh, control and then a standard fumigation treatment. I think the whole arch recycling trial is pretty clear, so I'll just move on. And these are just the data illustrating some points here. Um, responses to, uh, on the left, in the ASD trial, nothing. Control with water and tarp added to simulate ASD without any substrate at all. Um, fumigation with 1,3-D and PIC, the best the combination that we know of, shank applied, and then almond hull and shell, but nothing else, just dry soil amendment. Almond hull and shell with water and tarp, rice bran alone, and rice bran with water and tarp. So although this, the performance of our trees in terms of increase in trunk circumference is similar, um, or the best with rice bran, we did quite well, you can see, with either the full ASD ground almond hull and shell or rice bran alone. Um, so we don't, to overcome this problem, which didn't involve nematodes, just the prunus replant disease, there's a lot of working room to optimize the cost of those treatments. That's my point. And then embedded within, we had these treatments, all of them, we had uh, on multiple tree plots, we had a standard rate of N. This was a late planted uh, orchard, so we had less than we normally would, but uh, almost four ounces of N over the season, um, and then five and a half ounces of N. And uh, you see there was no improvement from improving the, the nitrogen application in this orchard. Across, this is across all treatments because there was only a main effect. It didn't interact with our pre-plant amendment treatments. And then, however, if we added phosphorus uh, at six ounces to the low rate of nitrogen, we got a significant benefit. Okay, that's the ASD trial. And here, just an illustration of my point that replant disease occurred as indicated by a strong growth response to fumigation in the orchard with or without whole orchard recycling. And also in the whole orchard recycling trial, we saw this same uh, influence of the nitrogen treatments and the same significant response to phosphorus. We don't normally recognize phosphorus as a need in, in young or mature orchards for almond. At least many of the growers that I talk to do not. But I think we're, we're seeing that it, they, it is in fact important. Um, I won't go through this, but my point here is that these new amendments used for ASD or um, just amendments alone are, are loaded with important nutrients. Rice bran is especially a good source of N, P, and K. Um, 
And these nutrients can be expected to impact the soil microbial communities, which we find they do, and also almond tree growth. Okay, Phytophthora, just a relatively simple comment. I'll cut to the chase. Um, uh, I think that once you've got your orchard planted, where the management really should focus is on soil water management. And countless orchards that I visit, I, in, in the young orchard problems with Phytophthora, I find drip lines, dual line drip, right up against the tree trunks. And um, this, as I dug away and exposed this root crown, you can see there's an infection running right up and it's the start of a canker. So soil water saturation is really key to managing Phytophthora and it goes back to the biology of free water allowing the pathogen to produce, release, and target zoospores to the host. So that's, that's really where it's at. It doesn't negate the value of rootstocks, genetic resistance, and the almond board is focusing a lot on developing and improved rootstocks. So I'll stop there. Um, I should say that interestingly, irrigation method seem to have a profound influence on the cyan cankers in Kern County too, where I first did this uh, uh, aerial phytophthora or perennial phytophthora canker research in Kern County, a large portion of the orchards were sub-drip irrigated as an experimental approach. And they were right adjacent to microsprinkler irrigated orchards. We found no incidence or virtually no incidence of the perennial Phytophthora canker in the sub-drip orchards and very high incidence in many of the surface microsprinkler irrigated orchards. So really the, the soil moisture management is where it's at for that disease too, I think. Okay, thank you. Gabrielle's reminding me, um, she asked for a comment about can we impact soil water management by managing how we um, uh, work the soil. And a big thing that we've noticed, and I think you'll hear more on that today, is that whole orchard recycling dramatically improves soil water infiltration, at least for, for many years after the whole orchard recycling occurs. It's a very visually noticeable effect. And I would say that for phytophthora diseases, I think it's very likely that that will um, reduce incidence of phytophthora diseases by improving the drainage of the soil right around the root crown. We've tried to demonstrate that in greenhouse trials, but it's very difficult to capture a realistic environment in greenhouse trials. And it's also very difficult to find growers that want to do that kind of study with inoculations involved in their orchards. So, but I, I think we can probably do that at uh, an experimental location later. Is that your question? Thank you. Okay. Folks, I'll continue the uh, comments about the Phytophthora. As, as was mentioned, I'm a, a CCA and a PCA. Much further south than here, uh, a lot of my experiences in permanent crops in Imperial and Riverside County. Please don't come visit in August. It's a little spicy. Um, so every, every, every summer, our summer starts in May, uh, if you didn't know that. But our, when the hot temperatures would roll in, I would start getting calls about Phytophthora, a lot on citrus and, and on, on avocado. You know, these trees would just start dying on us and, hey, come, come solve the problem. And so I go in, I do all the work up, find the Phytophthora in the soil, you know, confirm the, the diagnostics above ground as well, and then present the control plan to the grower, you know, with, with the fungicide. And then they look at the bill and they say, uh, see you later. Um, it's expensive to treat Phytophthora, so I was asked to, to find new ways to, to try to prevent the Phytophthora conditions from, from happening. So I kind of had to go back to the drawing board and really look at my disease triangle, you know, my, my crop host. I couldn't change that. I couldn't change the pathogen in the soil. That's difficult to do. But what I could, what I could manage was the soil environment. Change that habitat 
that the pathogen likes to live in. And Phytophthora is interesting, the, the root rot Phytophthora at least, likes to swim, it's like Michael Phelps. I don't know if it has as many gold medals. Um, but loves to swim. <laughs> I won't repeat what the comment was. Uh, likes to swim. And so if I, could, if I could improve the drainage of that soils, because that's what all these sites had in common. Very poor draining soils. And then as soon as that soil got hot, that's when it just made for those perfect environmental conditions. So I learned how to get really aggressive with soil surfactants, soluble calcium, this whole plan to keep drainage uh, up, keep the soil well structured, and keep that water flowing. Because if I could get the water draining to below a foot and keep that rest of that topsoil re relatively dry, I could reduce the risk of that Phytophthora. So that was my first introduction into ma managing the soil health to help manage pests. And um, it really, really paid off you know, nicely for, for everybody involved. We got to do a little bit different management style, avoid that fungicide use, save it for when we really needed it, and, uh, and, and everybody was happy. I would uh, advise the folks in the audience here, uh, Bill Brush said to, to stop looking at the trees but look at the soil. I want to take it one step further. Take your shovel and then smell your soil which is super weird if you Google image that search string. Um, stuff comes up, it's in my PowerPoints. But you can smell the conditions that will most likely force that Phytophthora. It has this weird metallic smell, lack of oxygen, and uh, really if you can kind of learn to smell your soil, maybe make the intern take the biggest you know, sniff so they get a bunch of dirt up their nose, it's funny. Um, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, just a little tool to use in the field when you're, when you're trying to figure out what's going on. So. Uh, I think there's lots of promise here, and, and I think that this environmental leg of the disease triangle, I think we're still learning how to manage it, and, and I think that's the future of, of disease control. Thank you. Well, hello. Can everybody hear me? <clears throat> so, my name's Rory. Uh, for the last seven years, I've operated almonds and walnuts here in Chico. Um, we, I, work, I worked for Nicholas Nutt, I guess I still do in some roundabout way. Uh, we have a ranch across the street, across Hagen Lane. We have a ranch across the Midway. And then we, if you know CJ's Diner up on Highway 99, we've got another ranch up that way, okay? And what I'm gonna be talking about is the, the ranch up that way, up off Highway 99. Um, so when I first got into the industry, I, I, actually, let me, let me tell you where I fall in the world first. I'm a conventional grower, number one. I'm not an organic grower but I use regenerative practices, okay? Number two, I'm a Bill Brush disciple. Man, we, 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 uh, we apply some lime up here in Chico, for sure, okay? And uh, <clears throat> we've seen our crop yields go up from 2,200 pounds to 4,200 pounds. So I don't just throw those numbers out there, but I, I, I'm hook, line, and sinker, Brush, Albrecht, Kinsey, okay? That's where I fall in the world. Um, Let's see, <laughs> I didn't grow up in agriculture, but I grew up, um, I, I grew up eating food, so I felt like I was, you know, a part of the system at some level. I married the farmer's daughter, okay, um, and her dad uh, farmed almonds and walnuts here in Chico, and we met in D.C., and we came back, and I started farming. My first day, I was told that there was a uh, lateral break, I didn't know what that was, and to dig it out and it became a, uh, a mainline break. So uh, four feet down, right? Okay. So that was my first day on the job here in agriculture uh, in Chico, right across the street at what we call our Comanche Ranch. Um, one of the first things I did, which we'll talk about next session actually, is uh, I started researching cover crop, right? Um, you know, you, if you have a compacted soil, how, how many people drive uh, uh, tractors in your orchard? Okay, you have compacted soil, okay? Um, this is a, a, heck of a heck of a deal for compacted soil. We'll get into that next time. Um, one of the things, we, we were taking out a Sir walnut orchard, an old legacy variety walnut orchard, and we knew that we had nematodes, okay? Um, we had uh, root knot, ring, and lesion nematodes, three different types of nematodes. But the problem was that we had a number of problems. Number one, we were by a daycare, okay? So, Number two, it was really expensive. Number three, we were farming by Highway 99. Number four, 
we were farming by houses, right? And number five, I looked at chemical fumigation and thought it was crazy. I thought it was wacko. I thought it was kind of like, okay, we're going in here and we're indiscriminately killing all this microbiology in our soil just to hit three target pests. Can we do a better job at that? I was in the Almond Board Leadership Program uh, with Miss Jenny Nicolau, who's over here. Can we get a round of applause for the Almond Board people doing this thing? This is awesome. So thank you all. Um, out of that uh, leadership project, I was learning about the industries. My first year in the industry, I was learning about the problems that were in the industry. One of the problems we had, quote unquote problems, was that we had this oversupply of our co-products, our whole and shell. And it appeared that many of our, our markets were going away, right? So we sell our holes to the dairy industry and then, you know, the dairy, California doesn't like dairy because they don't like poop and, you know, all this kind of stuff. They don't like methane, but so, so it appeared that our markets were going away. Oddly enough, our, I think, uh, holes are at 225 this year, so uh, that's a pretty good price. <laughs> but this problem was we had an overstock of almond hole and shell, and we needed to find a, a replacement for chemical fumigation. At least I wanted to. And I couldn't literally do it based on regulation because of the daycare and the houses, and so... But we had root region nematodes. And what I was hearing from my father-in-law, who'd been, he's actually a corn and soybean guy from Iowa. Um, he loves crop rotation, so we were going from, uh, you know, I guess the family knew about the, that thing called the Dust Bowl, right? So we had to go from walnuts to almonds, right? And, um, but we still had this nematode problem. And so um, after I realized there was this problem with hole and shell and maybe an oversupply of that, I was introduced to a scholar, uh, Dr. Christopher Simmons, who's at the Simmons Lab at UC Davis, who was kind of pioneering a type of anaerobic soil disinfestation called biosolarization. Has anyone heard of biosolarization? Raise your hand. All right, Richard Wakeout, you got one. I see that hand, I see that hand. Um, biosolarization was obviously a new concept to me. It takes, there's, the, we know a lot about um, solarization, okay, but, and I'm, I'm not going to get too much into the details of the science because it's just too, too detailed. Uh, the, the long and short of it was, as uh, Greg was showing up here, we could um, work almond hole and shell into the ground at a very high rate where we were going to plant the trees, okay. We could put tarp over it, total impermeable film over the top of it, clear total impermeable film, same stuff we use for chemical fumigation. Drip line goes under that, okay, and then we turn on the drip. What that does is it activates microbes, activates, this is, it's a, it's, it's a scientific term, activates microbes, okay, to ultimately eat the almond hole and shell and then create a biopesticide that kills these nematodes that we were trying to target and not indiscriminately kill everything else, right? Couple things. So, so I said, I said to the almond board and to Gabrielle and to um, and to Richard, I said I need money. This is going to take a lot, and I don't want to do it in the backyard of Davis. I don't want to do it at Kearney. I don't want to do that. I want to come do it at the Kitty Hawk Ranch up in Chico at scale, because this is going to be really expensive. Just as Greg was saying, this is we had to prove concept, right? So. The Almond Board came through, went through committee, got accepted, went through the right channels, got the dollars, and we did biosolarization at scale in a commercial orchard with uh, controls, and it was awesome, okay? We're still studying the effects of it six years later, right? Good science takes a long time, and as Vivian has already said, uh, usually these, these projects are one to three years, we're still looking at it. Now, the first and most, there's two critical things that happened that first three days <laughs> that we activated it. We had, in, in all that we, so we did almond hole and shell, uh, I think it was uh, two and a half to three ton, in a 10 foot swath, we tilled it in, we put the, we put the tarp over it, we put the, the, uh, the, the uh, drip tape on it. Within the first two or three days, we had a complete deactivation uh, in most of the 
uh, treated rows of every single root lesion or every single uh, nematode that we were trying to deactivate. In other words, it worked. Not only that, there was people in the industry, which I was listening to, that were saying, well, Rory, we get that methyl bromide down to four and five feet, brother. How are you going to do that? Well, we started pulsing with water, right? We pulsed that, that biopesticide effect down to water. We made a column, and we demonstrated that we could get that biopesticide even further down where methyl bromide is going to go, right? Now, so that's the first and most important thing. We killed our target pests, by and large. The second most important thing is that we increased our organic matter 1 to 1.25% in one day. We put it out, I tilled it in, we turned it on, boom. Okay, pretty cool stuff. We've heard a lot about soil organic matter today. Um, the, we have to be balanced. The, you know, over the last two or three years, we, as Nicholas Nut Company, we have actually been pretty cautious about this. I think the Almond Board has been pretty cautious about some of the things that have come out on this study. We know that we were, we were measuring, we had certain metrics, we're measuring the circumference of the tree trunk diameter to see, you know, as a, as a metric, like whether or not it's actually a healthy tree or not. Our treated rows had smaller diameter trees. Our controls were bigger which means, oh my gosh, what did we do here, right? I mean, this was a big risk that Nicholas Nut Company took on. At this stage now, we have either caught up to the controls or we have outpaced the controls, meaning the biosolarization rows are better, okay? I was, uh, I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the operations manager. For the last two years, I've had my shaker operators during the non-harvest call me and say, Rory, we need to stop shaking, we have an entire row of green nuts. Why is that? So I walk over there, it's a biosolarization row. We have healthier trees with more crop, with better quality in the treated rows. It took five years to figure it out, and we're gonna demonstrate that this year when we, when we actually uh, measure that. But it's, that's pretty cool stuff, right? So, Again, caution in the sense that this is very, very new. This is pioneering stuff. It took a lot of money to do this and to prove concept. We're nowhere near taking it prime time. But this is where we need to go. California does not like chemical fumigation. It will be gone. It just, I, think, I mean, that's, it's, you know, that's a controversial topic. Or we just won't be able to utilize it because it's just too cost prohibitive, let alone indiscriminately nuking everything in the soil when we're trying to build biology. So, that's biosolarization. There's going to be an article in, for you uh, PCAs, in the Pacific Crop Consultant. Is that a magazine that you guys, PCC? Progressive. Progressive, pro yeah, so we're progressive for sure. We're progressive. Um, it's coming out soon. It's on biosolarization. Look for it. It talks about the results up to this point and then what we're going to do at harvest this year. So, we're, we're in the run-in. We're making it happen. That's all I got. Thanks, Ray. I'm, Ray, can you just briefly talk about, you've also worked with cover crops and some of your experiences there in terms of weed management and gophers? Yeah, brief, brief. Um, so the first thing we did in the biosolarization field before biosolarization was plant brassicas uh, because brassicas have this really unique ability to suppress, quote unquote, nematodes. So that's what we did. We also saw, um, just like Daniel Unruh was talking about, um, we saw a, a huge increase in our gopher population, so much so that we had to uh, abandon our drip. I don't, this is another controversial subject, I, don't, I, I like drip in some ways, I really don't like it in other ways. Um, and uh, disease, desertifying the soil right under your drip, okay? Um, we just had to, had to get, get rid of it. I also had a, uh, uh, developed a walnut orchard, this is my last comment, developed a walnut orchard that was full of fleabane, completely full of fleabane. We hit it with 2,4-D, we hit it with Roundup Goal, we hit it with everything conventional we could, and we still had fleabane until I planted a cover crop. 
I planted a cover crop. It was basically gone the next year. There was a cedar on that, on that uh, no-till drill that was clogged at one point, and you can see the flea bane grow and the cover crop. It was incredible, the competition that happened. You got a weed problem? Yeah, cover crop. So you heard some very different perspectives. Any questions from the audience for our speakers? Do you have any idea of what the uh, compound, the biological compound is that John Walker in the code? I think that Chris did a lot of work uh, in the lab sorting that out with with nematodes so yeah why don't you why don't you take that no okay so i i mean my own perception is there's a whole complex of uh of uh volatiles that we would call and and also um organic acids that are not necessarily volatile and that that kind of suite of molecules is uh, active during the, the bio, so well, I'll ca I call it anaerobic soil disinfestation, but we also mean biosolarization during that process. And the process is active when you've got moisture, you've got covering with the tarp, <clears throat> and typically we run that for at least three weeks, preferably four to six weeks duration. And uh, as Roy, Rory brought out, um, when you add the moisture and you allow the diffusion of the extra nutrients that you put in the ground, that facilitates diffusion of the nutrients of the bacteria, and they're just gobbling it up and metabolizing. They consume all the oxygen, makes it anaerobic, and you generate these organic acids and volatiles because uh, it's basically the, the bacteria that can tolerate the anaerobic conditions generate these molecules. And uh, they, you know, depending on what the organism is, they, they're doing their action. And the collective result of all those things going on is, yes, you, you know, you killed nematodes, um, and uh, you also reset the microbial community that is active in mediating this replant disease complex that I talked to you about, which is, a, which is a separate thing from the nematode parasitism. So does that kind of answer your question? Okay. I would just say real quick, you know, Again, this, the, the questions are ongoing, but there's a lot of good material online. Just Google biosolarization, Chris Simmons, Simmons Lab, uh, and you'll, you could be, you know, there's a, a peer review that was published uh, this last year uh, in 2021 where you can get into the details there, but then there's also kind of just higher level stuff in kind of, you know, uh, online, so. I just want to make a comment about using the, the soil microbiome as, as management partners, right? We've talked about the, the two issues up here, and I, I mentioned my Phytophthora. One piece that's, that's really come to light as we've moved forward in this space is there's some things we don't know quite yet, but we, we tend to know sort of at a macro level that when you have healthier soil, you tend to have reduced you know, disease populations or, or other issues. But the why, how we get there, hasn't quite been resolved. And, and there's some folks that say, you know, if you boost your biology, your soil, uh, the earlier panel talked to us about strategies on how to do that. You know, can we create a microbiome that is out-competing the pathogens, this competitive exclusion idea that they can push those pathogens out for space, for resources, and create a more uh, suppressive soil that way. And there's also this idea that the microbes themselves have this relationship with the crop that they can help the crop push through periods of stress. Just take drought, for example, low moisture availability, high temperatures, and does the alleviation of that drought stress help set up that, that, that system to be more resistant to disease? So I think we're gonna get to the why here, probably not by the end of this panel, but maybe, maybe sooner or later, and I think it's a, it's a really cool space to be in and, and it's a cool space to watch.